Praise God. Hey, you know, the Witness Messiah, uh, for those of you involved, Witness Messiah, is not, it's not on today uh, because so many, you know, ladies are missing. 200 ladies are gone, and their husbands, if they have small kids, are home right now. We should almost pause and pray for them. <laughs> not for them, but for the children that they're trying to take care of. Um, so, so, anyway, there's, so there's no witness Messiah, but lunch is still being provided. Some of the guys stepped up to the plate and said, hey, listen, we're going to cook and serve lunch for those who want to uh, stay and buy lunch. And I've been handed uh, a sheet that says the full meal deal, $5, two tacos, hard or soft, tater tots, apple slices, and two cookies. Those two cookies sound really good. <laughs> um, anyway, there's corn dogs and there's tater tots, yeah, all this stuff. So lunch is being available to those of you who... Um, Need it. Mainly I mean you guys, your wives are at the retreat. Um, and anybody else. Lunch is going to be served uh, after the service, so please avail yourself of that. Friends, what we have done is this morning, I'm going to, a short message because it's the Daytona 500 Sunday. <laughs> um, you know, here's the deal. It starts 12 o'clock Eastern time, which means it started 22 or 23 minutes ago. When the service is done, I'm going home. Nobody's going to bother me. There's 365 days in the year, and there's 363 where I do not want to be bothered. This is one of them. If you are dying, call another staff member. <laughs> I was telling my mother in the first service, she was harassing me. She says, Mike, I'm going to come over and say, no, you're not, Mom. I'm going to shoot your tires out when you come in my driveway. If you call me or come over to my house today, I will break your arm. Just so violent, yeah, so violent, just rowdy, you know. Um, it's really funny, the Daytona 500 and the Talladega 500, and then the Super Bowl, yes, I can have family over and I can watch that it's like, it's just football, it's no big deal. But there's something about, so I just, I'm just going to camp out. My wife, before she left, got me all kinds of goodies, smoked oysters and clams and just, the, you know, chips, and I'm just going to sit down and watch the race. Some people say, Pastor Mike, don't you get, like, bored halfway through that race and they just keep going round and round and round? No. <laughs> I don't. I'm into every bit of it. I love the, the team, the, the camaraderie and the strategy and, and how they're moving. I, I love every bit of it. Don't call me. Don't stop and say hi. I will not think it's funny. I'm making a bigger deal out of it than when it started, but it just seems like it's gaining momentum here, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, anyway, I really like it. Some of you like watching a little ball roll on the carpet. Four. Some of you like watching a ball sail through the air and go through a net. Some of you watch a little black thing flying around on ice. Did you say fun? Oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> I can appreciate all those. I like watching racing. It's so, it's so, yeah, I just like it. It's cool. Anyway, what we're for in 2014 is really the motto. You see it on the trons. You're going to hear about this all throughout the year. For those of you who are visiting, I'll give you a really quick recap. We do not want society to continue to, I, to um, pigeonhole us, stereotype us, and identify us by what we're against. Well, we're against, you know, a homosexual marriage. We're against abortion. We're against pornography. We're against whatever we're against. Tragically, we've allowed the world to identify ourselves that way. So really, this year, the emphasis is us taking the initiative to say, this is what we're for. Here's the things that, that we believe in. We want to be identified for all the things that we're for. And you see all the different things on there. And generosity in the far left. Man, we just saw that happen last week in this. Amen? Amen. I mean, there's so many things what we're identified by. Right now, the kick off the year, the first part that I'm started was we're for maturity. We are for growing up. We are not a sensitive, a seeker-sensitive church. We're seeker-aware and I really believe that anybody who comes to a church, they're expecting 
to see worship and the preaching of the word of God. They should expect to sense the presence of God. We shouldn't have to tiptoe around and worry about, oh, offending them and we got to make sure. No, you made the choice to come to church. They ought to expect to hear the preaching of the word of God. Seeker friendly? Absolutely. Are we going to be so sensitive that we don't ever say anything for fear of offending somebody? No. Guess what? Grow up. We expect Christians to be mature. I know this. Coming right into it, you don't even know what you don't know. Why are we so easily offended? I remember coming to the church for the first time, hearing the gospel preached, and I didn't understand all of it. I didn't agree with all of it. I didn't, you know, I'm just, but I wasn't so rude just to get up and say, well, pfft, I don't believe in that, and just walk out. Forever, whenever you are changed or challenged with a new thought, there's usually an assault to your being. You need to be assaulted before you kind of go, hmm, wow. We ought to be careful that we don't let our minds become like cement, thoroughly mixed and permanently set. We need to be challenged. I tell you what, I really believe that the world is in the shape it's in today because the churches have not insisted on Christians growing up. Where have we ever gotten to the place where the highest expectation for you as a Christian is for you to go to church? I run into people all the time, and so do you. You say, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I go to church. Uh, well, good for you. Wow, you go to church. That says nothing about your belief or your spiritual maturity. It has nothing to do with your love for God and your service for Him. How much you've grown in a relationship with God. It just means that you made the sacrifice to get out of your comfy bed, run a comb through, well, most of, through your hair, <laughs> a brush across your teeth, put some nice clothes on, and leave the house. I run into people all the time. Well, Pastor Mike, I've been a Christian for 20 years. Really? Well, how come you're so doggone immature? Oh, that's right, because you haven't been growing. You got saved, you grew the first year, and now you've repeated that one year for 20 years. You see, I believe in spiritual maturity, that we need to grow up. I laid a case for maturity that was part of the series. You know, just thinking about Jesus, he says, hey, listen, by this my Father is glorified, John 15, 8, that you bear much fruit. Luke chapter 2, the axe is already laid at the, fruit of the, the foot of the tree that does not bear fruit. Talk about the talents. And the guy who just buried the one talent, Jesus says, throw that worthless servant out. God wants us to grow up, to become mature. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've been trying to identify what is maturity. And we look at Jesus, our master. And the only snapshot we see of him growing up is just kind of a, it's just kind of a summation of his maturity in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It's the passage of scripture where Jesus, as a, as a young child, was hanging back in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, and the family took a few days, journeys, a few days journey out. They came back, they found him in the temple, talking with the religious leaders. And then right after that story, Luke 2.52 comes along and says, and Jesus grew. This is just the summary of his life. Because the next time we see him is going to be when he's 30 years old, and he steps on the platform and the stage of life to reveal who he is. So in a capstone, to summarize what it mean for, meant for Jesus to grow up, to become mature, it says this. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature in favor with God and man, Luke 2.52. And I believe that that is what true maturity is. Far too long, the church has just emphasized this idea that you've got to grow spiritually. Friends, I know some people who know the Bible inside and out, backwards, upside down. Their theology is as square as can be. The problem is... They're not healthy in any other area of their life. Are they truly a mature person? No. Jesus grew in wisdom. He grew mentally. Jesus grew in stature. He grew physically. Jesus grew in favor with God. He grew spiritually. Jesus grew in favor with man. He grew socially. We've already covered mentally, physically, and it's so nice to hear some of the buzz of you guys still talking about many of you making life changes to get healthy to lose some weight, or some of you, if you need to gain weight, to gain weight. I mean, to, to really get to that place of health. 
I had one person tell me this just this past week. He says, you know, Pastor Mike, ever since your sermon on growing physically, being healthier, I go to the bathroom a whole lot more often now. <laughs> and what that person meant was this. I'm drinking more water, so I'm going to the bathroom a lot. Um, simple change to your diet. Literally, just drink a few more glasses of water. I mean, any change that we make is going to be good. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Okay, so this morning, I'm going to talk briefly and rather casually. I'm not going to be pounding the pulpit. I would like to just talk to you about this one area that I believe the church ignores. It ignores it in a horrible way. And that is that you need to grow up socially. To be truly a healthy, mature person, you need to grow socially. You need to be more friendly. You need to be nice. You need to have friends. Now, granted, does that mean that your personality has to change if you're an introvert? No, you can still stay an introvert. My wife, Orlean, is an introvert. Now, her job has forced her to become out of her shell a little bit more than most, but it doesn't mean that you've got to be this gregarious, outgoing, vivacious, wow, life of the party. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be your friend. In fact, that's not true for any of us. Not everybody's going to be your friend. But you can be friendly to everybody. Amen? Jesus, he's our example. He's our, he is the example in every way. It's really cool. Is everybody wanted to be around Jesus. If nothing else, out of curiosity. He was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. There was one group that really didn't want to be around him too much, and that was the religious people. He really irritated them. I'm trying to model my life after Jesus. <laughs> Every once in a while, for those of you who haven't seen it, I have this huge tattoo on my shoulder of a skull, just a, a skull. And it's just nasty and brains and drool coming out. And it's really cool. On his front teeth is the Ten Commandments. There's a little cross with the glimmer of his eye. But, but, they, but, my, my, but what people see is just this huge skull. And every once in a while, somebody will say to me, what's a skull for? Why all the skulls? And I go, ah, that's just to irritate religious people. <laughs> I, I, I am not exaggerating. On more than one occasion, the last time it happened, it happened at a, I'm not going to say the church. I was, I was at this church, and this lady came up, and you could tell she was all just pious and all whatever. You go right into the potato chip mode, don't you? <laughs> she looked at that, and she says, so what's the skull for? And I said, ah, just to irritate religious people. She goes, ah. And she walked off. I thought to myself, score! <laughs> it's still working. Do you realize when you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, I did a series on the Ten Commandments not too long ago. We went through that series. Teaching us how to live. So God wants us to live because he wants us to live an abundant life. Do you realize when you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four have everything to do with this relationship? You shall have no other gods before me. Don't take the Lord of the name the Lord that God in vain. Do not create any graven images and keep the Sabbath, uh, um, this, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Okay, the first four commandments have to do with this, our relationship with God. The following six have to do with this relationship, how we live with one another. Don't, or honor your father and your mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Your neighbor's stuff. How do you do this relationship? How we get along with people is huge. Well, if people would just leave me alone, I'd be a lot happier. You're missing the point somewhere in there. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, it's, the pa- it's the passage of Scripture where Jesus, or the Apostle Paul is writing to uh, the church that Timothy is overseeing. He's telling them how to appoint leaders. And for various denominations and fellowships, how they govern themselves, these are the rules for trustees and, and uh, board members, deacons, pastors, you know, elders, bishops, whatever you want to call them. Just, that, just vaguely say, for leaders, leadership in the church. And you all are working 
to be leaders. Here's the deal. You are all leaders. You need to realize that. If there are people watching you, you are leading others. You all are. wonder how, what kind of job you're doing because you're all leading others. But now there's this idea of a mandate of even a higher calling of leading intentionally for others. And in chapter, verse 7 of chapter 3, 1 Timothy, he says, He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into the disgrace, into the devil's trap. He must have a good reputation with outsiders. In other words, with non-believers. You ought to be able to get along with non-believers. You ought not to be this kind of person that says, well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but everybody else thinks badly about you because you lie and you cheat and you steal. You're stingy. You badmouth others. You talk back behind others. Again, you got all this knowledge, but other people know what you're really like. Friends, wouldn't it be interesting and a little scary, seriously, if you could really know what others, how they perceive you? See, you all see yourself as lovely angels, don't you? No, some of you are going like this. No, well, get working on that, man. <laughs> no, really, wouldn't it be interesting to see how you really, how other people really perceive you? I mean, I know I see myself as, as one thing. I see myself as, you know, pretty nice guy. I don't understand why somebody wouldn't like me. I mean, maybe not right away, because I can be a little obnoxious. <laughs> but give me a time or two. Give me some time, and you might like me. I was at Mr. Large the other day, south end of town, and the guy said when he first came to town, he says, you know, I heard a lot. I knew you way before I actually met you. He said, there's, a, there's some people that really don't like you. <laughs> I'm thinking, that's great. How do you do? He says, no, really, he says, they really don't like you. He says, but then I've met a lot of people who really like you. He says, and I tend to believe the people who like you more than I believe the other people. And I have to admit, you know something? You can't make everybody like you. If you're standing up for what you believe in and other people are against that, they're not going to like you, just like Jesus. But I'm not talking about that. Let's, that be, let's let that be the exception instead of the rule. The rule is that we need to be growing, that we could be friendly. Oswald Chambers, there's a, God, this thing's going all, the sound system's going all doo-wicky here. Maybe the battery's getting tired. Maybe the nut behind the wheel's a little loose. I'm not sure. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to co commit to memory so much that you can dwell on it, that quote from Oswald Chambers that I shared with you two weeks ago. Because you will get to know this quote. Because I will say it enough. And it is so permeated. In fact, when you meditate on this verse, you will look at my life and you go, yep, you have modeled your life after that verse because it's so true. In so many things that I say, you see this verse in action. Oswald Chambers, he said this, the main thing about Christianity is not the work we do but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. Friends, the main thing about Christianity is not all the things we do. Well, I'm wearing Christian jewelry. I got a Christian bumper sticker. I go to church on Sunday. I have my devotions. I'm serving in the nursery. I'm... The main thing about Christianity is the relationship we maintain. That relationship with a living God, our glorious Savior, a friend of friends. It's that relation. That's the main thing about Christianity. Do you realize that spiritual warfare can be, including casting out demons and all that kind of stuff? But the main thing about spiritual warfare is you fighting your way to make sure you spend time in the presence of your Heavenly Father. There are so many things to distract you when you realize that your number one goal is to sit at his feet and to worship him and to be in this relationship, to hear his voice, to experience his presence. Okay? The main thing about Christianity is not the things we do, but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. I don't know about you, but I come out of that relationship with more patience, more joy, 
more appreciation for all of God's goodness in my life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See, I, I've never understood these, these, these intercessors, tragically, they've got a bad reputation in my mind. Because I've run into so many over the years. First of all, this idea of, I'm an, if somebody says they're an intercessor, just rebuke him in the name of Jesus right away. Let's just get off to the, there's no such thing as an intercessor. In the, in the 80s, it got kind of, in the 90s, I mean, it got kind of out of hand and everybody was an intercessor. And no, we're all intercessors. There's no ministry of intercession. Well, I'm an intercessor. What they're really trying to say is, I'm trying to be somebody. Ooh, did I just step on some of your toes? What I always found unique is, real often, who claim to spend so much time with God, least like him. These were the most religiously fanatical, egalistic, critical, cynical of others, backbiting, slandering others, because nobody else is doing it but them. I'm just thinking, you claim to spend all this time with God, and you're less like him. The Bible says that you become like the people you hang around. If I start getting more that way, the staff all has permission. Pastor Mike, how are you doing in your devotions? Because I get more that way when I fail to spend time with him. When I spend time with him, I am more patient. I am more gracious. I am more forgiving. I'm kinder. I'm more appreciative for the simple things in life. How can you not be like, more like him when you spend time with him? You see, the main thing is that we spend time with him and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. See, atmosphere, socially, what are we like? What are we like? Atmosphere produced by that relationship. Um, wow. Let me tell you a quick story. I think I told this story just not too long ago, but it bears repeating. Because we can fool ourselves sometimes in this thing called Christianity. Quite a few years ago, I mean many years ago, we had a youth pastor, and I had to let him go, unfortunately. It was very difficult to do. But when I was on a couple of our walks, that we take these long walks, and I just say, hey, my dear brother, you're, you're missing what it means to love people. Yeah, but I got to give him the... And I'm just, I'm just like, oh, man, he told me the story on one of our walks. He said, you know, Pastor Mike, when I was a young person in our youth group, we lost our youth pastor. We had 20 kids in it. And I, because I was a senior, and I was just so on fire, they just kind of let me take the leadership over of it. And, and, and cool, he says, well, yeah, he says, you know, and he said it in, a, in almost a boasting way. He said, you know, that youth group went from 20 to 4. He said, but they were the four of the most serious on-fire people. He said, all those other people, they just, they just kind of dropped off. They weren't really... And all I thought was, you're missing the picture. The picture is to help all of them grow up and mature together and include others with them, to love them. How easy it is to be self-righteous, thinking that, well, yeah, I'm the only one that's got it together and I'm not going to let other people stand in my way. Friends, there's a time to let not people stand in your way, oppositional forces, but this idea of not getting along with others, Jesus was pretty holy, yet people wanted to be with him. Where have we ever gotten the idea that you get so holy that non-Christians just don't want to be around you? Somehow or another, you've reached the pinnacle of repelling others. Jesus was God, and people wanted to be around him. See, wherever I go, and I know you're the same way, I want people to be around me except for the Daytona 500 and the Talladega 500. <laughs> Otherwise, I want people to be around me. I want to, I mean, I didn't show up at the racetrack the very first time I showed up at the racetrack. I didn't wear my collar and carry my Bible and step onto the racetrack in the pits and just kind of walk around going, I'm here. <laughs> no, it's about loving people and being in relationship with people and loving them. And then you can hear the whispers. Hey, I think, I think that guy, he's a preacher. His nickname is The Rev, and I don't think it means RPMs. <laughs> Friends, I'll tell you something. Kindness never goes out of style. Kindness never goes out of style. 
I've told the story a few times. I actually got some pictures to, to prove it now. In just a minute, I'll show you. But, you know, in, in, in um, high school, um, our daughter, her senior year, was nominated on the homecoming court. And growing up, I have to admit, I, I'm, I've been so blessed. Friends, you need to understand, I've been so blessed. The board has always been a blessing to me and my family. And, but in the early days, they've always been generous, in, you know, in setting my salary as generous as they could and all that, taking good care of me. But in the early days, there just wasn't any to give and kind of thing. So I've worked two and three jobs, and, and we didn't have a lot. And my kids kind of look back in, in those days and kind of, you know, a little bit angry at God. They've since gotten over it. But, you know, they went to school. They didn't have the nicest clothes. They didn't have the nicest things. And, but they never went for want. And I've had to remind them of that many times. But growing up, we've always told our kids, kindness never goes out of style. You don't need the, need the neatest sneakers. You need to be a nice person. You don't need the latest clothes. You need to treat people with respect. You don't need the, what you need is this. It's how you treat people. So we were surprised as our daughter, when she was elected to be on the homecoming court, our daughter Samantha, um, we were just shocked because, again, she, she's not all that. She just loves people. She loves life. She's gregarious, outgoing. And when it came to the, for those of you who've ever heard about being on the homecoming court, I digress for just a moment. It is the week from hell. If you're on the homecoming court family, horror stories I could tell you. I tell you what, man, we had one time, that whole week, they kind of, it, I think it's, it's fun play that gets out of hand. We've heard of dead animals being thrown on people's roofs, um, dead animals thrown in people's pools. Um, we had a car pull up one time to uh, paint, uh, paintball our house. It was the week I didn't sleep because you're guarding your house. I am I'm not exaggerating. One time a guy came whipping up and I had, he was surprised when I had, I walked on the deck with my shotgun. <laughs> And I pointed it, and I had blanks in there, and I fired it. Boom! He hit the ground. He's tearing for his car. I mean, it was great fun, man. We, I had lights set up on the deck so that at midnight or whatever, if I seen activity out there, I could hit the switch, and we'd light up the whole yard. We had guys on walkie-talkies, my brother-in-laws. We'd man the street. So if a car came down, and they did, they'd park down there. We could block them in if some damage happened and that kind of thing. We had a car whip up one time and um, was shooting, and we shot, broke the window out of their car. The inside of their car instantly got filled with paintballs from us. The police got called. It's not a fun week. <laughs> Let me just tell you that, okay? So, so anyway, but I digress, okay? So, so we come to the actual event of, of the coronation. So Orlean and I are in there uh, with all the other parents of all the courts, the guys in the, you know, for the homecoming king and the homecoming queen. So we're all in there, and, and the ladies, I think I've told you in the past, beautiful. Their hair is all done up. Their makeup is on perfect. they got these beautifully expensive gowns on. The guys are in their tuxes. We, as their parents, we're all kind of sitting sort of in the same section on, the, on this side of the gym. They're all coming in that side. They're going to walk up front. And so the guys come in this side, and the girls come in there, and they come walking down. And in comes the first woman, and, oh, young lady, she's just gorgeous. Second one, just gorgeous. Third one, just go forth, gorgeous. In comes our daughter. You could almost, nobody would be so rude as to say it. But friends, you could sense in the air. Some people looking and not wanting to really catch our eyes, but just feeling kind of bad for us. Because Samantha was wearing just a, a black skirt with a white shirt with a Spider-Man tie. <laughs> hair spiked and goggles on her head. Now, now, you need to understand, she didn't want to be disrespectful to the whole deal. She just, that just wasn't her. So she asked for permission from the teachers and all that. They said, yeah, as long as you wear a dress, you know, these shoes. And she said, it's good. And um, so, again, nobody would ever say it, but they kind of looked, you could see that there was a feeling in the air you could have cut with a knife. It's almost like the people who didn't know who we are, it's like, oh, that poor girl's parents. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a shame and kind of a, kind of a very uncomfortable and a thing, but we, man, we're, again, we love our daughter, we're proud of her, and kindness never goes out of style, that's how she got to where she is, she didn't get there with all the fine clothes and all the whatever, she was just, kindness never goes out of style, and that's what we told her, so they're there, I think we got a picture of her, of the, of the homecoming group there or somewhere, up there, okay, 
there they are. Okay, you see what I mean? Gorgeous, 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 and wunderbar. Um, so, so then there's our daughter. Okay, then, then, okay, hold it right there. So again, so you could just sense in the air that the feeling, well, that poor girl doesn't have a chance, you know. So the crown's going over the head. And all of a sudden, they set it on her head. The crowd had a collective gasp. With this. And all the student body, this huge celebration. You know why? Because kindness never goes out of style. Okay, so the next picture. There's everybody celebrating and congratulating her and all the excitement. And crown, tiara, goggles. <laughs> and then there's the, the whole uh, homecoming court right there. Uh, goggles still on her head. A tie. And um, that's, can, is there any others? I can't remember. Any others? No. Oh, there we go. There. Yeah, anyway. I told you the story. Now you've seen the pictures. <laughs> Friends, kindness never goes out of style. You and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to realize that Jesus Christ expects us as we grow up and become mature, that we're kind to everybody. There's no excuse. We ought to be nice. We like to be defined as, you know, spiritual giants. I can cast out demons with a single bark. You know, um, yeah, but, but are you nice? You see, growing up, being mature is growing socially as well. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 is a list of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, the evidence of, of maturity growing in the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness. Look at that. Kindness, it's right there. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such there is no law. Kindness never goes out of style. And wow, we got an echo going on now. Can you hear it? Or is it, you can all hear it? Okay. It's not just me. <laughs> Every once in a while I wonder. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm just going to close with this. And I thought I'd be done already, but I'm just going to close with, with this, the five P's of success. You've heard me say it before, but I want to take this opportunity to emphasize it one more time. I don't care in your marriage, in your work world, or in Christianity. Anything you do, these are the five P's to success. Number one, principles. Do you know what to do? If you're an electrician, do you know the difference between volts and amperes? <laughs> Amp amperage. I mean, do you know how to hook up positive and ground? I mean, do you know what to do? Practice. Can you do it? Or are you just a Cliff Clavin? <laughs> you know everything, but you can't do anything. Okay, you got to know it. You got to be able to do it. And then number three is people skills or personality. Do people want to do it with you? Because I can tell you, friends, you can be the best at knowing something. You, may, you might even be the best at doing it. But if nobody wants to do it with you, nobody can stand to be around you, guess what? You are an ultimate failure. I've talked to many business owners. They're hiring people. They could hire some people that were way more talented, way more skilled. But guess what? Nobody likes the people, so they wouldn't hire them or they had to get rid of them. Bob Kilpatrick, when he was here, the musician, songwriter, he was here, went out to lunch. We were talking about a time where Randy Stonehill was calling him up to, to uh, getting ready to do their next album. And the first question Bob asked Randy, because Randy was talking about how skilled he was and how good he was and whatever else, he said, is he a good hang? In other words, is he the kind of guy you want to hang with? Because I don't care how good he is, how talented he is. Do you want to be around him? You see, can I just venture to say that some of you, just because there's so many in this room, some of you are very good at what you do. You know what to do, and you're very good at it, but nobody likes to do it with you. I'd like to see that change so you could be truly successful. The fourth P is persistence. Stay at it. You know, I have discovered that overnight success usually takes 20 to 30 years. People show up at church, and they go, oh, Pastor Mike, you're so blessed. Look at this. And I'm going, yeah, it just sprouted up out of nowhere. 
Persistence. And the fifth P, any guesses? Fifth P, what would the fifth P be? Passion. Passion. Friends, whatever you're doing, you ought to do with all your might as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.27 and then 3.24. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. Do it passionately. Heavenly Father, I pray even now, God, that you help us to realize that we're not truly mature until we've grown socially as well. Father, I pray that you'd help us to remember by Samantha's example that kindness never goes out of style. Father, simple things that you've taught us, a cup of cold water given to the least of these you've done unto me. Father, I pray that you'd help us to grow up. Help us to be truly mature. Help us to realize the value, the importance of developing our our social skills, considering others better than ourselves, thinking of others first, showing kindness, showing compassion, integrity, respect, dignity. And Father, we'll be quick to give you the thanks and the praise. Amen. Would you stand? Let's just close in a chorus together. Hallelujah.